Well, thank you. I'm grateful for being here, and I want to thank the organizers for this nice and interesting conference. Um, I'm going to talk about conserved energies, um, and this is joint work, conserved energies for NLS, MKDV, and uh, KDV, and this is joint work with Daniel Tataro. And before I state what exactly what we do, I want to give the equations. So there's the NLS equation. Uh, it's I one-dimensional I dt u plus u x x is equal to plus or minus u squared u. So plus is, so in the minus case, it's focusing, then there are solitons. In the plus case, it's defocusing, and um, there are uh, no solitons. Then there is the m modified KDV equation, um, which is ut plus uxx. And I realize I did the first thing I didn't want to pay attention to. Um, plus so minus 6, how do you want to write it? u squared, I want to write it like this, 2u squared u x is equal to 0. OK, now I want to add in a plus or minus, and then it's the focusing or the defocusing one. I want to write it with the absolute value here in order to allow um, complex solutions. Then it's a complex MKDV, uh, otherwise it's the real one. And then there's a KDV equation, which is ut plus uxx minus 6u ux is equal to 0. And all these equations are pretty connected. They are integrable. And the integrability shows in the existence of a Lux pair. Um, and I want to write it in the following fashion as a system. Uh, psi x, psi is a, uh, that's the x derivative of a map to C2, is equal to, and now I only write it for the defocusing case, for the plus case, uh, I C u u bar minus plus I C c. So this is the Lux equation. Um, c is a complex <laughs> is a complex parameter. Um, and the amazing fact is that if we complement it with an equation for the time derivative is equal to I now I have to look it up because I can't remember these things. Plus u squared, value u squared, 2i cu plus ux minus 2i c u bar minus u bar x to c squared plus u squared c. So these are two um, first order equations. And the interesting, the, the very interesting structure is that um, if we want to solve them simultaneously for given data at one point, general, then this is only possible if a compatibility condition is satisfied. And the compatibility condition is exactly the defocusing NLS here on, on this side. So, uh, and the connection to MKDV is the following. So for MKDV, there's the same structure with the same operator here, the same equation here, and a different equation on this side. So there's a different, uh, different time uh, equation for the time derivative, and then there's the same structure. This is solvable for general, for, for given data at a point, let's say 0, 0. Um, x equal to 0, t equal to 0 for general data, if and only if, uh, then u satisfies the MKDV equation. And for the, fo for the focusing case, um, there are some sign changes which I don't want to go into. It into. So the only case, the only sign change here is a minus sign, and here it is more complex, but this equation doesn't play a big role for what I'm going to tell. Now, what is the effect of that? 
Well, suppose we take C, let's say with the imaginary part of C, large or equal to zero. Then we might look for used solutions. I mean, it's a two by two system. So there is a two dimensional space of solutions and I want to normalize them on the left. So if I want to have that C behaves like e to the minus i c x, zero on the left, so the case to the left for x to minus infinity, then um, on the right, let's suppose that u is compactly supported, uh, then on the right it decomposes in a linear combination of two, well, with a similar, similar fundamental system on the right, then on the right we get the decomposition that C <coughs> behaves like T to the minus one of C E to the minus I C X. And well, here we have to be a bit more careful as x tends to plus infinity if c is a real number. So um, we get a linear combination of the two solutions which we would have, the, of a fundamental system, which would have a few which would be equal to zero. And I use this to define t to the minus one, which works well even if the imaginary part of c is positive. And there's a reflection coefficient. This is called the transmission coefficient and the reflection coefficient. So T is the transmission coefficient. <laughs> now, the <laughs> fact that uh, the equation, the NLS equation, is um, the compatibility condition for solving these equations allows us to solve this equation at plus infinity. And check what happens with this at plus infinity and minus infinity, and check what happens with the function psi. So at plus or minus infinity, we don't see the effect of u. So what we see here is um, a constant coefficient differential operator. It gives the time derivative of psi in terms of uh, c here, and no u. So we can check this. And if we check this on the left, then there are some time evolution if you do it on the right. There's some time evolution, and what we see then is that uh, t of c is independent of time if we have a solution. If you have a solution to the NLS equation. So, whatever, if you look for quantities which are conserved for NLS or mkdv or kdv, we simply have to look at the transmission coefficient, we have to see whether we can define it, and this is a conserved quantity. At each point, we may integrate it, we may do whatever we want with it, and this gives a conserved quantity. So, um, well, this is some sort of old, fairly old, um, goes back to, well, in, in this context to uh, Aplowitz, the AKNS uh, this is Segor, Newell, and K. Kaup. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so they did it for the nonlinear Schrödinger equation, and uh, then there is an expansion of T of C, which is equal to um, minus 1 over 2 pi i times a sum of this is formal. Maybe we should write it like this. This is a formal sum. And then there are the energies Ejc to the minus j minus 1. Well, so this is at uh, c tending to i infinity, or depending on what you assume on the initial data. Anyhow, it's, it's, a, it's the Laurent series at infinity. And then E1 is equal to the integral u squared dx 
and E2 is equal to the integral ux, uh, sorry, uh, u2 is equal to i times u, u bar x, the momentum, and E3. I did something stupid. I want to have this one, uh, 0, 1, and 2 equal to the integral ux squared plus um, 2 times u to the power 4. Ah, it's u to the power 4 dx. Which one is it? It's, it's a, it has a 2 here. So, um, and then you can continue, and it's classical to um, expand these things and to get, get recursive formulas. And what I want to do is I want to, what I did in the joint work with Daniel, we sort of interpolated between these quantities in order to get a continuous family of conserved quantities. Uh, well, that's not exactly what we did. So we more or less, more precisely, we interpolated between the even ones and not even that. We interpolated between linear combinations of the even ones. So here is what we, what we get. <laughs> um, well, the things which we define. So on, let's first look at the focusing case for NLS and MKDV. Then ES can be defined as an integral over, well, at least for Schwartz functions, for Schwartz potentials, as an integral over the real line, uh, over the logarithm. It's always the logarithm which occurs of the transmission coefficient evaluated at the real axis, so for that we need some decay on some uh, Schwartz functions and have, would have to study um, the decay, which we don't do, but, it, but let's suppose that the logarithm of t uh, is a Schwartz function, so um, say a bit more about when these things are defined later. So the one way to defining it is to integrate over the real axis and to put a weight which is some, something like the Fourier weight for Sobolev spaces. Um, uh, c to the 2s, so this is for s larger than minus a half. And then another way of expressing that is to, doing to move the contour of integration to the line from i to i times infinity, and that gives the second, uh, the, the second formula, which is equal to 4 sine pi s integral from 1 to infinity. So now we're uh, writing this in a real fashion. Uh, we get tor squared minus 1 to the power s, Time this logarithm evaluated at i tor over 2. I see I forgot a factor 1 over 2. It should be evaluated at xi over 2 on the left-hand side. So we evaluate it at i tau over 2. And then we have to do some corrections because the weight c to the s grows at infinity polynomially. So we have to correct that in order to be able to do a contour integration. So we subtract the... Oh, I messed up the... I wanted to, wanted to call these guys H, so H1, H2, yeah, so we correct, we have to correct the behavior at infinity a little bit, thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah. That's the only place where I wrote it. <laughs> okay, so so we have to correct the behavior at infinity in order to get to be, uh, to be able to work with the contour integration to move the contour. And if we do it in this fashion, then this doesn't depend on how many terms we correct if we have the regularity. And uh, so we get this formula here. What you see here is that if s is an integer, then the sine pi s vanishes, and here you get the linear combination of the classical conserved quantities. So in that sense, we interpolate between the classical conserved quantities. Well, then we can do th the same thing for the focusing NLS. If you do the same thing for the focusing NLS, then we have to 
adjust for eigenvalues of the AKNS operator. So the AKNS operator has eigenvalues in the upper half plane and we have to uh, adjust for them and there is a function, there's a way of doing that, evaluate. So we have to add a sum over the eigenvalues with a multiplicity mj over some with some function xi and nothing changes on the right hand side. Now for KDV, that's the same structure. Uh, first, if s is equal, is larger than minus 1, then this is a generalization of the classical formula of Fadeyev. There is a different function xi. We have to adjust for the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues in this case are minus you know, uh, kappa j squared. And on the line from i to i to infinity, there's a similar expression as for the NLS equation. And again, we have to adjust for the classical energies. Something special happens at s equal to minus 1. So the left-hand side makes sense for minus 1. And for the right-hand side, there is this part of the integral, which makes, has the effect of converging to a delta function combined with the sine pi s. So the outcome is then 8 times the transmission coefficient evaluated at a half minus this integral u. And here, one has to do some normalization, which I don't want to take a, take much about, talk much about. So uh, these are conserved quantities for NLS and MKDV. They go back to AKNS or to Fadeyev. Um, this relation between the different contour integ integrals. Um, and these are the objects we want to work with. Now, defining these objects for Schwartz functions is trivial because then um, the scattering transform becomes something nice. The logarithm of t is a Schwartz function on the real axis. And then it's an exercise in complex analysis, maybe not an entirely easy one, to get these formulas. So as I said above, since t is independent of time, whenever you have a solution, whatever you do with t is going to give you a conserved quantity. So the question is how to relate them to um, things we work with in analysis, how to relate them to Sokolov spaces. And I want to give the results first and then explain a bit about the proof. <laughs> Thank you. you. You see how it works. Yeah, I tried it before. <laughs> but it's always a bit different when I do it on the blackboard. Yeah. Is it okay? I guess you still can have an impression of the formulas, even if you don't see all of them. <laughs> um, so the theorem, as Daniel Tataru. So what we do is we, I mean, we look at the right-hand side. We define the quantities by the right-hand side, and then it turns out that uh, it, it makes also sense with, with the left-hand side. So the first thing is, if u is in Hs, then both sides are well defined. Both, both sides are well defined. Uh, but basically, you want to look at the more on the thing on the right hand side. And so the map from Hs to Es is continuous in U and um, yeah, also in S whenever U is sufficiently regular. And it is analytic if i over 2 is not an eigenvalue. Well, 
Well, you can't expect it to be an eigenvalue if this, so this is in the focusing case, because then this function xi is not analytic at one. So this has to be excluded. But otherwise, it is analytic, and it's jointly analytic in S and U in the appropriate sense. So whenever U is in H sigma, then it's analytic in S for S, then, then ES is analytic in U and sigma, uh, U and S when S is less than sigma. So I don't want to write that, but in an appropriate sense, it is has all the properties one would have, want to have it. Uh, and the nice thing is we can play with both sides in order to get whatever is more convenient. Second, um, well, how does it compare? I mean, so this, this says that it's analytic, so whenever u is in hs, then this is defined, but the question is, does this control the hs now? Well, um, so we can look at e s of u minus u in hs, well, which is basically the same as the left-hand side, but for the Fourier transform evaluated at, I didn't correct all the xi over 2 se. sorry. Um, so this is on the Fourier side similar to the integral on the left-hand side, and this is less or equal to a constant times u in hs squared, and now I want to use a strange norm here, and I want to explain it later on. Um, if u in L2 d2 du2 is less than delta for some delta depending on s. So this tells us that the quadratic part of, I mean, it's analytic, so we can do an analytic expansion in u at zero, and the quadratic part of that is exactly the hs norm. So for small, if, if this quantity is small, I'm saying, going to say more about that in a minute, if this quantity is small, then this quantity and the hs norm are pretty close uh, together. And also, what happens in that case is this function psi of the eigenvalue, kappa j, is large or equal to a constant times kappa j to the power 2, uh, sorry, the real part of kappa j, Japanese brackets to the power 2s, times the imaginary part of kappa j. So all, if this is small, then all quantities on the left-hand side of the formula are non-negative. So there's a similar statement for KDV. So this is NLS. Bigger than minus one half, yeah. So. <coughs> and there's a similar theorem for KDV, where there is the same sort of statement for S um, larger than minus one. It's the same statement. And if S equal to minus one, then it's the same statement, but for uh, h minus 1. And we have to take out the potentials so that um, <coughs> um, minus 1 over 4 is an eigenvalue of the Schrödinger operator, and which makes sense because then we want to evaluate the the singular function, this logarithm at uh, one half, and that we can't, uh, the logarithm at one minus uh, one at zero, and that we can't. Okay. Now, some corollaries. 
Um, the first corollary, corollary, if you use this in scaling, then um, we get that if u0 is in Hs, I don't specify this prop, which problem, but if you're in this range, then uh, the soup of u of t in Hs is less than infinity and could, it could be made more precise for the solution for NLS, MKDV, or whatsoever. The second corollary is, well, um, the, if you look at solitons, solitons co correspond to eigenvalues, at breathers, and anything else, <coughs> what you want to define in terms of the spectrum, then they're all stable in HS for all S in that range. So, this is a question of scaling. Here we might scale, so if you look at the formulas, now we look at the left-hand side. Then in the left-hand side, if the smallness, is, the smallness condition is satisfied, then every term is positive. And if you look at the second line, then the soliton is the one where the logarithm of t vanishes on the real axis, and there is a one contribution corresponding to the eigenvalue. So this is the lowest value ES can take when you have whenever you have the soliton. So this ES is a Lapinov functional and it's minimized at the soliton. Uh, and similarly at the pre-thor, which is also characterized in terms of the spectrum. Okay, so there's one thing on the blackboard which I didn't explain. Um, and I don't want to go into it, I, at least not too much, but I want to give some information. I have this du2. So what this u2 is, it's something like h minus a half. Uh, h plus a half, if you don't have a derivative. So h a half is a space with half a derivative, and it has doesn't have any good structure, because <coughs> there is no embedding into continuous functions. Uh, L1 doesn't embed into h a half. So this space doesn't have homogeneous space. This, this space is not good for most things we do in analysis. This u2 is a replacement of it and it has all the good properties one would wish to have or many of the good properties one would wish to have from a space with half a derivative uh, and uh, it's still on the same scale. It's on the same scale also in the sense that if you look at the Bessoff space then b one half 1, 1 embeds into u2, embeds into 1 half, 1 infinity, so it's, it's a very close space to this h a half. And du2, these are the formal derivatives, they are like things with h minus a half, same sort of embedding, and then there come similar spaces with the same properties v2 and dv2, and there is a good duality between these things. So yeah, I mean, what, what, what do you have here? You have embeddings into bounded functions. You have limits at infinity for these functions. You have uh, embeddings of L1 into um, du2, into dv2, and so on. So all the things which uh, don't work for, in, 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 which don't work for h a half or h minus a half, many of those things work for u2 and v2. So um, in particular, what is relevant here, so if you look at this L2, d u2 is defined by the norm. So we take a function u, and then we multiply it by a smooth cutoff function, x minus j. So this is something which lives at the bump of size 1. We take this thing into u2, and this is pieces, and then we take an LP summation over that, an L2 summation over that, and similarly with, with LP. So we take small pieces, we sum them in L2 and LP, and then this L2, if you look at this L2 d u2 norm, then this is less or equal to a constant times u in H s, or s for all s larger than minus a half. So whenever you could possibly hope 
to get a good bound like that, then this quantity is going to be bounded and it's smaller than it's, it's controlled in terms of all Sobolev spaces. Uh, so I could replace it by any HS here, uh, H minus a half plus epsilon, and then the state, that's the same statement is true. So, so can I ask a question though? Yeah. But if S, if you take a U in S between like minus one and minus one half, that could be infinity. So you have a bunch of things, but you don't have line two. Is that correct? Uh, so I take U yeah. in HS, yeah. purely in HS, but S less than one half. Yeah. Minus, less than minus one half. Yeah. So then you have the first part of the theorem, but you don't have the, the second part of the theorem, then it is. <coughs> No, so he, the, the, the assumption S larger than minus one half is for both parts. Oh, I see. So nothing of that makes sense. I'm not quite sure about the uh, some, sorts, some sides of the equation, but nothing makes sense if you. Right. Uh, right. And what's the analog for the KDV part of, of, of the U space? Ah, so I should have given that. So for the KDV part, you have to replace simply replace L2 du2 by h minus one half, and uh, minus one. You take h minus one. <coughs> okay. Um, well, what I present here is connected to a lot of literature, and I can't go uh, into all of that. I mean, the inverse scattering part for this AKNS system is due to uh, Aplowitz, Kaup, Neville, and Zico, um, Fadeyev, and many others, Lux, I, mean, I, can, uh, uh, I guess there's no point in repeating this, uh, the history in inverse scattering, and I'm sure that there are other people in the audience who can do that much better than I could do it. Um, for the a priori estimate, I should say there is a sort of a history which is different. <coughs> there is, maybe I don't write it, there is there are a priori estimates by Christ, Colianda, and Tau for the uh, nonlinear <coughs> Schrödinger equation. Um, I did some a priori estimates, not, uni not uniform in time, but control over all for all times somehow, <coughs> with Daniel Tataru up to h minus a fourth um, for the nonlinear Schrödinger equation. Um, there is a lot of work on the KDV equation. Um, I did some work on the KDV equation in H minus one with, with Tristan Buckmaster, some uniform in time a priori estimate in H minus one, which used a bit of inverse scattering, but not much of the structure. Uh, there is the work which was done simultaneously by Kilip, Vishan, and Chang. Uh, Kilip, Vishan, and Chang. And uh, Rowan gave a talk on it last week. Uh, on the KDV equation uh, for S, I think that the talk was for S between minus one uh, less than zero, but I guess he uh, also some extension beyond zero, probably one. Yeah, what I, what I, what I think I said was one. That's one. Uh, and you worked with the So you worked with this term here, and oh, I have to correct the type. Yeah, that is important. So um, you worked with this term, and this gives this allows to, to show an equivalence of this, this single term here with the HS norm, well, and integrated versions of that, which lead probably to something similar than the formula on the right-hand side uh, with a simple single correction at j equal to zero, which is the L2 norm. So uh, it would probably give the same formula as this one in, this, in, the, in that range. Okay, so... I want to have to lift them up again. Now, how do we prove it? Well, uh, 
the strategy is to bound, the, to, to control the integral part on the right hand side. This is the most essential part. Once we have control of the integral part on the right hand side, it also gives the control um, by limits, by certain limits, um, of the whole right hand side. And then, if you look at the defocusing part, uh, this allows to, I mean, first we look at the transmission coefficient, not in the whole half plane, but in the, so we start with looking at the, we have some smallness conditions, so we control, we are going, we try to control the transmission coefficient t of c uh, away from the real axis. And the smallness condition ensures that we can rescale things so that whenever we get it somewhere, we also get it, uh, let's say, below one half, i over two. And then, at least morally, we have a harmonic function. The, the logarithm of t is a harmonic function, which in the defocusing case has a real part uh, less than zero. So then we are able to interpret this as an, uh, such a harmonic function on the half space, and then the real part of that is going to be a measure, and that allows to define the left-hand side. So if we use then that in the defocusing part, the t of c is lesser or equal to 1, then the logarithm has, the real part of the logarithm has a sign, and then we can take the trace at the real part, and that gives an interpretation of the formulas on the left-hand side. For the focusing case, one also has to use then the backlund transform, but I don't want to go into that. What I want to do is I want to explain how we can prove, how we can control the integrals. Well, so we go back to the AKNS system. So the AKNS system was C1 prime is equal to minus I C C1 plus u c2, c2 prime is equal to i c c2 plus u bar c1. And what we want is, we want a solution so that we want c behaves like e to the minus i c x zero at x equal to minus infinity. Okay. So then we can try to solve this equation recursively. So we, we want to get a power expansion in terms of u. So in the first step, we integrate this equation. And then we get c2, 1, is equal to the integral from minus infinity to x times e to the i c x, well, maybe you could take a bit of y, y minus x u bar of x e to the minus i c x dx. And then we take, we look at psi, the, so this stands for the iteration, C12, and we get something similar. And then... So, 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 so you have a prime? I mean, you have it one and prime? Or? So this is... You got to one, and above it's a prime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then we get the first, we get t is equal to one plus the limit as x tends to infinity, um, C11, one, one, of x plus, then we do this iteration, and we call this guy t2 of c, um, e to the <coughs> i c x of this guy. So we have to multiply by this, and then we get t4. And these terms have a pretty nice structure. So if you do the, the math, then this t2j of c is equal to an integral. And here we have x1 less than y1. So we iterate this thing up to y21 
for j, here we get um, e to the 2i c, um, the sum over the y j's, or by k's, minus the sum over the x k's, times u of y1, u of y j, u bar of x1, u bar of xj, dy, dx. So, you do the iteration and then you get a pretty nice representation. <coughs> the imaginary part of C is positive, so this is negative whenever this thing is larger than this one, and we have the y's on the right-hand side, so that leads to exponential decay <coughs> here whenever we are in the upper half plane. Okay, so you do that, then you try to control these things, <coughs> and I guess I'm running a bit out of time, so I have to decide what I want to focus on. Um, so then the first uh, estimate, type of estimate, is that this, is that this T2J of C is bounded by, uh, well, I guess I don't want to go, to go into that, um, a constant times the U e to the minus i real part of c x u in L2, and I put it the imaginary <coughs> part here, c u d u 2 to the power j. So this is where the properties of the spaces d u 2 come in nicely. You have to take, to put the oscillatory part into u, and then uh, they give very naturally this estimate here where this imaginary part of C corresponds to the localization in space to uh, intervals of size imaginary part of C to the minus one. This is exactly the scale on which this exponential decays. So there is this, this concentration. I wanted to say a bit about that, but I guess I'm going to skip that. So this is the first estimate and it allows to get convergence Provided, provided this quantity is small, and this is basically where the condition in the theorem comes in. Okay, so far so good. Then we don't want to get estimates of in, in terms of this thing. Uh, we want to get estimates in terms of HS norms. So how do we get, go from here to HS norms? Uh, well, we can do embeddings, we can use embeddings and then we get some variety. I mean, we can use embeddings here and look at the scaling parameter and get powers of the imaginary part and this is going to allow to get some of the integrals. But it only goes up to a certain point and then we have to look at the logarithm. We have to look at the logarithm of this thing. And now I want to, to uh, if we go to the logarithm, then well, actually, the way we did it, I think I did make another sign error. Um, the inverse of that. Anyhow, so we get. We want to take the logarithm of, the, of t to the minus 1. So this is t to the minus 1 is a sum of <coughs> integrals, which I write in this fashion. So this is the trivial integral. This here is the first integral which we had here. This is the second integral. So I wrote it here in red. I hope that it's visible. So this codifies the information that x1 is less than y1, less than x2, less than y2, and then we do the integral. And then we have this with three things, with four things. And then if we take the logarithm, we get a lot of combinatorics. We can split the integration domains into the sets where we order the, the variables. And this is messy. This is, this is really messy. So I did it for the first part. I got the second part. I explain what the, this integral 
stands for in a minute. I think I computed by hand the, these things here up to here. And then I was convinced that the structure somehow persists, but uh, in, at MSI I was stuck with that. We were stuck with that and didn't know what to do. But it was important for us to get this structure. Let me explain what this structure is. So this goes, so for every arc which is going up, I put an X. For every arc which is going down, I put a Y. And then I get an, here an ordering that X1 is less than X2, less than X2, X3, less than Y1. This is going up, that's X4, less than X4, less than Y3, less than Y4. The indices don't matter, but this codifies this integral here. The nice thing here is that we always have the last y on the right of every x. So this here has a much better decay on the domain of integration as the original integral because it decays exponentially whenever two of the variables are far apart. So whereas this, this information here uh, leads to decay of order basically uh, at, at, at most imaginary part of c to the minus j because this is the local this is the size of the corresponding um, uh, simplex. Here we get a decay like imaginary part of c to the two to the minus to the minus two j plus one because the last y is on the right. Well, so the last so we, we can't split these things into uh, what I said it was not good. So, in, but no matter what we do, is, but this decays exponentially whenever we put things apart. I and mean, here we could, in, in, in these integrals, we could have the situation that y1 is close to x1 and y2 is close to x2, but x2 is far away from y1, and then we wouldn't get decay. Okay. I pay for that with the combinatorics. Right. So at MSI, there was the fortunate situation that uh, in, in this program there was were people from probability, and I showed this question to Martin Heira, and Martin Heira told me that I should look at Hopf algebras, and that it would be, would be related to a famous formula in Hopf algebras. So my colleagues in Bonn are still. Uh, when, when I told them about Hopf algebra, they were in, in the colleagues in algebra. They were excited. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something uh, which can be used. <laughs> well, but, but then I tried to get it into context with the Milner Moore theorem, and that didn't work. So the basic thing is it's not a not big effort to show that this is a Hopf algebra because it's very close to a standard Hopf algebra, which I didn't know, but that, that can be, that's not so difficult, the shuffle algebra. Uh, and the Milner Moore theorem would give the conclusion if that would be a co-commutative Hopf algebra, but it's a commutative one. So <laughs> it sounds almost the same, but it is not. But, <laughs> but then uh, still, if one tries to do things by foot, basically, then uh, all integrals are connected. Then one gets the structures. So, where are we? Well, we have this estimate here on the t's, which transfers to the expansion of the logarithm of t. So we get the estimates we need whenever j is large compared to s. So if you look at a high, high order polynomial, then things are easy. But since we get that, we have to look at the lower polynomials case by case. And if you look at the conserved quantities, then it's clear that something has to, has to happen. Because if s is less than 1, less than 0, then there is no conserved quantity which, which hurts. At s equal to 0, you get the L2 norm. So you have to handle the L2 norm. This is easy. Uh, this is easy because with the L2 norm, uh, if you check T2, well, let's say if, if, you, check, yeah, if you check T2, then this is equal to u in hs squared. So that requires a 
simple calculation. So the two term is okay. Now, yeah. Uh, now at the level of the uh, the next term, at the T4 term, that corresponds to the next um, at, 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 the t at the level of the t t T4 term, you expect the L4 norm to the power 4 to show up uh, at the level S equal to 1. So this has to be taken care of. Now, with this connected structure, you get up to this point. And the idea to go beyond that is pretty simple. This is do an integration by parts in the integration with respect to y1. If you do an integration by parts, you get a derivative which falls on this. Um, sorry, if you do an integration by parts with respect to this, uh, this exponential, so you gain a factor 1 over c, and the derivative falls either on this, then you get the same formula with the derivative, or uh, you get to the boundary terms, and then you have an integral of one dimension less. And then you continue to do that, and if you end up with no in with a one dimension integral in the end, you get the conserved quantities, and otherwise you do similar estimates as I explained before. So I guess I went a bit over time. I'm sorry for that. Thank you for the attention. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, this isn't the structure of Fredholm determinant? I have no idea. Fredholm determinant? No. I mean, probably it has something to do with Fredholm determinant. I have no idea. I guess you know that better than I do. I mean, in KDV, I mean, that way. So I knew that on the matrix case before, right? right? For the scalar case. Right? This, this is exactly the operation. I mean, this is exactly the operation of passing from the series of t. I mean, it's yeah. taking a log of a series is sort of restricting to the connected diagram, just taking the, the determinant. Yeah. Right. yeah. The real point I wanted to make was okay, so again, in the matrix setting, I haven't gone into detail, but in the scalar setting, it's actually a general phenomenon that the transmission coefficient is the Fredholm determinant because the, the integral kernel mm -hmm. is semi separable. I mean, it's a function of the lesser times a function of the greater. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, what was my point? Uh, yes, in that's, if you'd asked the problem was that setting, then you might have recognized it because that's exactly what makes processes on the line Markovian. Well, right? I mean, wh why is the Ornstein Ullenbeck process Markovian? It's because the kernel is semi separable. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that, with these things. Uh, but what I think is true is that there's a lot of combinatorics behind which can be ex expressed in various ways, right. and it should be it should be connected. I mean, one thing in the with the Hopf, with the, I mean, the, the reason why Martin Heira is interested in the Hopf algebra is I think different. It's closer to what what I presented here, and not not the Fredholm determinant. But um, the thing which is striking is there's this theorem. It's not difficult to get. And it's not difficult to use Sage in order to compute these things to any order. But uh, people I asked were sort of stuck with explaining what the coefficients or this expansion should look like, what the coefficients should look like. So this is a sort of big miracle. It gives connected integrals, which is what we need, but we don't have any access to the size of the coefficients. And maybe the Fredholm determinant determines allow to get that more explicitly. There's a lot of combinatorics behind, right. which I don't understand. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, right, there's a gen I have to go open, right? There's a, Stanley's enumerative of combinatorics exactly has a, a theorem which says, if, you're, if you have a generating function generated with the coefficients of the number of objects of this type, then the logarithm of your generating function is exactly the generating function of the number of connected objects of this type. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds, yeah. So, uh, it's like cumulants. I would be interested in the reference. I'd yeah, like I to get that here. Yeah. I was happy to get to get that, but uh, it's clearly related to many things. Well, yeah. I want to just comment on, on this uh, estimate. I think C is independent of J, and if so, it's yes. articulating that uh, that this is that you're really creating a, a the transmission coefficient is a holomorphic function of u and u bar, 
Yes. And these are the Taylor coefficients. Yes. 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 Exactly. So, yeah. sort of the uh, McKean Trubowitz picture of the world, which is objects are holomorphic with regard to functions. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? So if not, thank you again.